Starship performed a major pre-launch test, China launched another crew, and India's capsule is closer to a crewed flight. I'm Alicia Siegel for NSF. It's Friday the 27th of October, and there's much more to come this week in Spaceflight. Sponsored by Brilliant. Russian cosmonauts Oleg Kononenko and Nikolai Chub performed a spacewalk on the outside of the ISS this week, but it seems like luck was not really on their side. Now, don't worry, they're fine. It's just that the tasks that they had to perform didn't exactly go as well as they'd hoped. The first task for the pair of cosmonauts was to isolate the backup radiator on the Naoka module from the main cooling system of the module. Now, if you remember, a few weeks back, this backup radiator had leaked its coolant overboard, so the cosmonauts were instructed to isolate it from the main cooling loop to avoid any potential leakage, and also see if this backup system could be repaired. So, of course, after isolating the system, the next task was for them to assess any damage to the radiator panels and its systems. But a few minutes into that, the cosmonauts started to notice that the site of the leak was now leaking even more coolant to the point where it was also contaminating their suits. The spacewalk footage, which you're seeing on screen right now, shows the bubble around the leak site wobbling around as the astronauts move next to the radiator and try to take pictures and such. This bubble was seen spitting out more coolant from other angles, too. So it seems like the isolation work may have rattled the coolant loops, causing some leftover coolant to keep leaking out. But in any case, the observation portion of the task had to end early, and the cosmonauts had to continue with the rest of their remaining work for the spacewalk. This work included the release of a nanosatellite with a solar sail, but after release, the solar sail appears to have not deployed, so it likely failed as well. Another task was to deploy a synthetic radar communication system, but one of the panels of this system wasn't able to deploy too, so that was another thing that failed as well. Although Roscosmos thinks it may be able to repair this on a later spacewalk. Now, yes, hardware can break and things can leak, but at the end of the day, the important news is that, of course, despite the bad luck, both cosmonauts got back inside of the station safe and sound. Their suits that were covered with that pesky coolant, they were wiped down, thoroughly cleaned, and hey, the satellite was a demonstrator anyway, so the fact that it failed was actually no big deal. But this, again, just highlights how incredibly dangerous it is to perform these spacewalks. And there have been many other, even more troubled spacewalks in the past from both the Russian and the U.S. side of the station. Fun fact, Oleg Kononenko was actually the same cosmonaut that went outside the station back in December of 2018 to inspect the Soyuz MS-09 spacecraft. Yeah, that spacecraft with the knife cutting through the Soyuz protective layers. He's definitely seen quite a bit of action while up in space. ABL Space Systems has shared a major update about its RS-1 rocket, and it's gearing up for launch soon. This update came straight from the company CEO Harry O'Hanley, who wrote about what happened with the first flight of the rocket and what's coming up next for the second flight. In his post, he explained that the company is now close to finishing their investigation on the failure of the rocket's first flight. In short, during the launch, a fire started in the engine bay that burned through wire harnesses, causing a loss of power to the stage. This closed the propellant isolation valves, and with those closed, the engines basically shut down. ABL believes that this fire was triggered due to recirculation of the exhaust plume underneath the rocket while it was on the launch mount. These hot gases essentially breached the aft heat shield, starting the fire in the engine bay that then led to the failure. So one of the solutions, apart from redesigning the engine bay to be tougher, would be the construction of a better and taller launch mount that prevents the gases from recirculating and going back up against the base of the rocket. You know, this whole engine bay on fire thing kind of reminds me of another rocket that also failed recently on its first flight. Yes, of course I'm talking about Starship, but this just goes to show that even a small rocket like ABL's RS-1 can still have launch pad and engine fire issues like the monster rockets, AKA Starship. For the next launch, which ABL hopes to carry out soon, the rocket has been upgraded to the Block 2 configuration. This configuration carries 20% more propellant, has a more modular design for better and faster manufacturing, and has more engines. If you remember, the RS-1 engine arrangement is a bit weird, as it has 9 engines, but instead of having them arranged as 8 engines surrounding a central one, all the 9 engines are just in a circle with no center engine. Well, now for Block 2, the company has added what it calls a double barrel center engine. Now, it's not clear whether that's one engine with two nozzles or two engines that are just joined together, but this could make the engine arrangement 
even more weird. Given this update, it seems like ABL is preparing for a launch real soon, so here's hoping that it's successful this time around. Up next, we'll be taking a look at the launches of the week, but before that, here's Sawyer with a word from our sponsor. Next to me, I have three boxes. Two of them contain a silly Ares 1X rocket, but that third one contains a prize. Go ahead and make your pick now. Here, I'll help you out. Let's show you what's behind number one. See? Silly rocket. Do you still feel comfortable with your pick? It's a classic problem known as the Monty Hall Dilemma, but did you know there's science behind it? Well, you can find out for yourself using today's sponsor, Brilliant.org. Brilliant.org is continually adding new math, science, and computer-related lessons to their library of thousands that make learning easy. Turns out there's something called Bayes' Rule that might influence your next pick. It's all part of a course on knowledge and uncertainty that looks at the Monty Hall Principle. Time for the big reveal. The prize was behind door number three. Now, what is the prize, you may ask? Well, you can visit brilliant.org slash NASA spaceflight or click the link in the description below for a 30-day free trial. The first 200 of you will also get 20% off Brilliant's annual premium subscription. I know Aries 1X fans are already coming at me in the comments section, so let's get back to the video. Now let's take a look at This Week in Launches. Starting off the week, we had the launch of a Falcon 9 on October 21st at 823 UTC from Space Launch Complex 4 East in Vandenberg. The rocket was carrying a batch of 21 Starlink V2 mini-satellites into low Earth orbit. The first stage for this mission, B-1061, was flying for a 16th time, making it the fourth booster to reach that many flights. It successfully returned to Earth, landing on the deck of SpaceX's drone ship, Of Course I Still Love You. Another Falcon 9 launch took place this week on October 22nd at 2.17 UTC from Space Launch Complex 40 in Florida. The mission, Starlink Group 624, was notable for carrying not 21, not 22, but 23 Starlink V2 mini-satellites. This is the most Starlink V2 mini-satellites that a Falcon 9 has carried, and it was possibly Falcon 9's heaviest payload to orbit yet, although SpaceX doesn't usually provide the exact payload mass. The first stage for this mission, B-1080, was flying for a fourth time, and it successfully landed on the drone ship a shortfall of Gravitas. With these two Starlink launches, SpaceX has now put a total of 5,331 Starlink satellites into orbit, of which 363 have re-entered and 4,409 have moved into their operational orbit. A Changzhong 2D rocket launch took place this week on October 23rd at 2003 UTC from Launch Complex 3 at the Xichang Satellite Launch Center in China. The rocket was carrying the fourth trio of Yaogan 39 military reconnaissance satellites into low Earth orbit. For those counting at home, this is now the eighth launch of Yaogan satellites in the last three months. This week, we also had the launch of China's latest crewed flight to the Tiangong Space Station, the Shenzhou 17 mission. Liftoff took place on October 26th at 3.14 UTC from the South Launch Site 1 at the Jiquan Satellite Launch Center. The Shenzhou 17 spacecraft was carrying Commander Tong Hongbao, who was flying for a second time and is now the first Chinese astronaut to visit the Tiangong Space Station twice. Along with him were Operator Tong Shengzhe and Systems Operator Zhang Xinlin, who were flying into space for their first time. After a successful launch into orbit, the Shenzhou-17 spacecraft docked to the front docking port of the Tianhe module of China's space station about six and a half hours after launch at 9.46 UTC. The crew of Shenzhou-16, which has been on the station for the last five months, will now hand over the command of the station to the crew of Shenzhou-17 and should return to Earth in the next few weeks. This week, we also had the successful in-flight abort test of India's Gaganyaan spacecraft. The mission, dubbed TVD-1, had to first be delayed due to weather, and then again due to a faulty sensor during engine startup, but the launch finally took place on October 21st at 4.30 UTC. The mission was set to test the performance of the launch escape system for the Gaganyaan crew capsule. For this mission, the Indian Space Research Organization, or ISRO, used a modified GSLV Mark II booster to push the capsule and its launch escape system to the conditions that they would see during the phase of flight of maximum aerodynamic pressure. The booster ascent phase took about 61 seconds and placed the Gaganyaan crew module up to an altitude of 12 kilometers and at a speed of about 410 meters per second. This is when the escape system activated and pulled the capsule away from the booster as expected. This escape system is very similar to the Soyuz and Shenzhou escape systems, which sport not only a launch tower with solid motors that pull the capsule away from the rocket, 
but also extra motors on the launch shroud that give an extra push for low altitude aborts. It also sports a set of four grid fins for stability during coast phase and separation. While the booster and capsule went into low-level clouds shortly after lifting off, ISRO has released onboard camera footage of the event showing the steps, from separation of the booster to the separation of the launch shroud from the capsule, and then parachute deployment. The capsule successfully splashed down just a few minutes after liftoff and was recovered and transported back to shore, where engineers will now be looking over all of the data from this flight. So far, it looks like all went as planned. So that's another test in the bag for India's crewed spacecraft and one step closer to its first crewed mission. Starship is now closer to launch than ever with the latest round of testing completed and with new updates on the paperwork front coming in from the Fish and Wildlife Service. While we've seen Ship 25 and Booster 9 being stacked and destacked several times in the last month and a half, this last stack finally at last saw some action. This past Sunday, the full stack completed two partial tanking tests ahead of the full-up wet dress rehearsal that occurred on Tuesday. During a wet dress rehearsal, all launch procedures are rehearsed, including evacuating Starbase and Boca Chica Village and going through the countdown until pretty much the last few seconds of it, right before engine ignition. After the test, SpaceX confirmed in a post that both vehicles were ready for launch pending regulatory approval. That regulatory approval also seems to be on the right track, with the Fish and Wildlife Service releasing an update this week about the progress of the ongoing written re-evaluation for Starship's second flight. According to the agency, it initiated the Endangered Species Act consultation with the FAA on October 19th. This came in just 14 days into a 30-day period that started on October 5th when the FAA sent the final biological assessment for the Fish and Wildlife Service to review. The agency now has 135 days to issue an amended biological opinion, but it says it does not expect to take the full amount of time. For reference, a similar procedure had to take place for Starship's first flight, and it took about a month until it was complete. So we may be seeing a flight not too long from now. October 19th was also the day that we saw Fish and Wildlife employees at Starbase seemingly assessing the place and helping out with cleanup procedures for the debris from Flight 1. These cleanup tasks were continued on October 25th, with personnel clearly seen around the area and trucks being used to remove the leftover debris. Hopefully all of this work means that the paperwork can be closed out as soon as possible. But that's not all, because we now have, yet again, a local notice to Mariners indicating a potential launch date for Starship. The latest one from this week indicates a launch date of no earlier than November 6th. But I have to again point out that video that DOS made explaining all of the tea leaves that we have to read in order to figure out when one of these launches will actually happen. Long story short, this notice in particular is not the best to look at when planning your trip if you really want to go see Starship in person. There are still many more things to look out for and this notice is just one of those things. So maybe wait just a bit longer with those plans. Now let's take a quick glimpse at some other stories across space. This week, NASA announced the successful integration of the Artemis II Orion crew capsule with its European service module. The operation took place at the Neil Armstrong Operations and Checkout Building at the Kennedy Space Center back on October 19th, and now that it's complete, teams have a lot more work to go through until all is ready for mating with the SLS rocket. The two parts will be powered up and checked out during several tests in the months ahead, and key hardware like the service module solar panels will be installed as well. Before stacking with the rocket, ground crews will also have to install the launch escape system and the shrouds that protect the spacecraft during launch. There's definitely a lot left to do, but this is quite the milestone. The UK Space Agency has partnered with Axiom Space to send a commercially sponsored UK astronaut mission to the International Space Station. While details about this potential mission have not yet been finalized, this now adds another country to the list of those that have partnered with Axiom Space to carry their own astronauts into space through commercial flights. This list includes the United Arab Emirates, Saudi Arabia, Turkey, Italy, and Sweden. This also likely means that there are more flights ahead for SpaceX's Crew Dragon spacecraft, as it's the only spacecraft currently in commercial operation that flies to the ISS. ULA has set the launch window for Vulcan's first flight and, well, let's hope that Santa Claus doesn't violate the range for this one. It's happening on Christmas. The three-day launch window opens on December 24th and, according to Tori Bruno, the launch time is set to occur at night, so get your ugliest Christmas sweaters ready for that one. 
In any case, preparations are already underway at the launch site with the start of stacking operations for Vulcan. Meanwhile, at the factory, the Centaur 5 upper stage is almost complete and should be shipped to the Cape in the next few weeks. Once the rocket is fully stacked, ULA will perform another wet dress rehearsal before mating the payload and proceeding with the launch. Another rocket getting ready for its next launch is Firefly's Alpha rocket. The company recently shared an update claiming it has now completed stage testing at their Texas facilities and it's sending the rocket off to its launch site at Vandenberg. Alpha's next flight, its fourth overall, will carry a set of CubeSats for NASA under the Alana 43 mission and it's planned to occur no earlier than December. And now let's take a look at what's coming up next week in spaceflight. Next week, we'll have a pair of back-to-back -back Starlink launches launching from each coast of the United States. First will be the launch of the Starlink Group 7-6 mission from Vandenberg that's set to occur within a 4-hour and 20-minute window opening on October 28th at 6.16 UTC. If launched on time, this should break the turnaround time for this launch pad at under one week between launches. After that, we'll have the launch of the Starlink Group 625 mission from Florida. That one is set to occur within a 4-hour and 31-minute window that opens on October 28th at 23.13 UTC. NASA astronauts Jasmine Mogbelli and Laurel O'Hara are set to perform a spacewalk next week on the ISS in order to remove an electronics box and replace a faulty component on a rotary joint of the station's solar panels. The spacewalk is set to begin on November 1st at 12.05 UTC and is planned to last for approximately six and a half hours. NASA's Lucy spacecraft is set to fly by asteroid 152830 Dinkinish this coming week. Closest approach is expected to take place on November 1st at 1654 UTC at a distance of 430 kilometers from Dinkinish. This will be the spacecraft's first of many flybys during its mission. Next week, we'll also have the fifth commercial flight of Spaceship Two flying the Galactic 05 mission from Spaceport America. The flight is set to take place on November 2nd in the morning local time. And that's your weekly update of spaceflight news. Thanks again to Brilliant for sponsoring this video. Be sure to get your 30-day free trial and 20% off an annual premium subscription at the link below. We'll see you all again next week to recap This Week in Spaceflight.